Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we follow up on the story of uranium mining in the Grand Canyon, where last week, mining interests won an important decision one that allows them to go full speed ahead with contaminating that magnificent national park with uranium mining as early as April 15th of this year. That's tomorrow as I'm recording this. We talk again with Allison Gitlin of the Grand Canyon chapter of the Sierra Club, as well as Sandy Barr from that same chapter, on what this decision means, how it came about, and what we can do to fight against this latest outbreak of nuclear insanity. Then we'll hear from Chuck Johnson, Northwest nuclear campaigner in Oregon and Washington State for Physicians for Social Responsibility. We originally spoke with Chuck on nuclear hot seat number 195, but we focused on the Hanford site then and weren't able to include his information about problems at the Columbia Generating Station. That's what you'll get today. Those interviews, plus our ever-popular numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, the Daily Show Twitter campaign, and more nuclear information than I bet you Canadian Broadcasting puts into its coverage of the World Uranium Symposium and Uranium Film Festival this week in Quebec. But you'll have all that information coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 14, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting off in Japan this week, where you'll remember in last week's episode that TEPCO started stating that molten fuel might be out of the pedestal of Reactor 1. Hmm, you think? Well, on the 10th of April, TEPCO put a robot into the primary containment vessel, or at least what's left of it, of Reactor 1. That was at about 9 o'clock in the morning. However, by around 2 p.m., it stopped moving having only gone about 10 meters. Now, the plan was to collect images, temperature, and dose data from Reactor 1, and TEPCO says that even in the short amount of time it was there, it did report two-thirds of the planned data. However, of course, TEPCO did not announce what that unscrubbed data revealed. TEPCO says that they do not know the specific cause that the robot was stopped. It said, hmm, maybe some cable could have been stuck somewhere. The other possibility, the elephant in the living room, is that maybe the radiation fried the equipment. And as was stated last week by the head of the company, the equipment capable of going in and doing what needs to be done at any of the destroyed reactors at Fukushima Daiichi have not yet been invented. But that didn't stop a new high school from being opened adjacent to the official radiation exclusion zone in Fukushima Prefecture. It opened its doors on April 8th and included many who had fled the area and the 2011 nuclear disaster unfolded. Here's the thing. The town of Hirono, which is where the new high school has opened, was just barely outside of the 20-kilometer exclusion zone, meaning just 12 and a half miles away. So with all that moldering radioactive waste just over the horizon, they're putting their high school students at risk. Interesting that the students will be receiving special lectures, a.k.a. propaganda and indoctrination, from visiting experts including government representative Shinjiro Koizumi, who just happens to be the Liberal Democratic Party's, meaning Shinzo Abe Baby's party, the parliamentary secretary in charge of recovery in the Tohoku area. Bet he's not going to be warning them about radiation exposure, you think? A 39-year-old native of Iwaki in Fukushima Prefecture, who also happens to be a French chef, has decided to not only open a new restaurant, but that it would serve meals prepared exclusively with regional food products. Harutomo Hagi said, 
I became convinced that gourmets would come all the way to Iwake to enjoy the taste of local food products. So I decided to run my restaurant in a way that I really wanted to, even if I risked having no customers. Not once in this article from Asahi was he questioned or was anything written about possible radiation contamination in the food and the water. And speaking of the water... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Man, Japan is really hitting every button it can find to try and convince the world that its food and water are perfectly safe to drink. Here's the latest one. Fukushima City's bottled tap water has won a gold award from something called Monde Selection, a group which likes to compare itself to the Michelin Guide at pointing out that which is highest and best and most excellent in our food supply. What they don't bother to mention in all those pictures of the mayor of Fukushima holding up a bottle of his water is that this whole thing is a hoax paid for and delivered. Why, you may ask? That's because in order to compete in Monday selection, every company must pay a fee of 1,100 euros, which is just under $1,200 American. In exchange, more than 80% of all products submitted end up with some kind of award or another. It's not a competition because there's no limit to how many awards can be given out. So Japan sends in a little bit of fuku water in a bottle. Et voila! We have a gold medal award winning water. Enriched with the most cutting edge of radionuclides. And the problem is that when those poor schmucks show up for the 2020 Olympics, meaning the athletes and the tourists, they're going to see, ah, award-winning water, as they cheerfully glug it down. And that's why Monday Selection, as well as all of you idiots in Japan trying to convince us that black is white, white is black, and when it comes to food and water safety, pay no attention to that nuclear disaster behind the curtain. You, yes, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Over to the United States, where U.S. District Court Judge David Campbell denied a request to halt new uranium mining at the Canyon Uranium Mine, located only six miles from Grand Canyon National Park's South Rim. That story is going to be covered in depth in this week's interviews, coming up in just a few moments. In Oregon, a large boat suspected to be debris from the Japanese earthquake and tsunami in 2011 was spotted off the Oregon coast on Thursday, April 10th. The fiberglass boat is around 25 to 30 feet long and appears to be half to two-thirds of a larger vessel. Biologists okayed the move after passengers were found on board, 20 yellow-tailed jacks and a striped beakfish along with the mussels and barnacles that were attached to the hull, it was determined by biologists at the Oregon Coast Aquarium and OSU's Hatfield Marine Science Center that the organisms were not a threat to the Oregon Coast ecosystem. Now it would be nice if somebody would test that boat for radiation, but that was something that wasn't even mentioned in this article. It is interesting that the amnesiac media are treating this like the first incursion of Fukushima-based debris into coastal waters of North America, when back in June of 2012, a huge dock washed ashore in Oregon. It was 66 feet long, 7 feet tall, and 19 feet wide. Hard to miss it. Activists from No Nukes Northwest attempted to get to this dock to register its radiation levels, but before they could do so, the dock was removed by the Environmental Protection Agency, whose officials promised that this dock would be tested for radiation and the results made public. To date, 
Nothing has been heard further of this stock. It will be interesting to see if we do hear anything as regards this latest piece of debris from Japan. Some nuke reactor news. Both Calvert Cliffs nuclear units in Maryland were tripped offline on April 7th because of what is being called a localized grid disturbance that caused power outages in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. The resulting power interruption temporarily spooked the Washington, D.C. area, causing a brief blackout at several federal buildings. Even the White House had to briefly shift to backup power, though it is doubtful that with the power outage, the White House would have melted down. And the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has cleared the Perry Nuclear Power Plant in Ohio to begin using what they are terming high-performance fuel, which is really high-burn-up fuel. The problem with high-burn-up fuel is that it is far harder on the structural integrity of the reactor, which was not built to maintain safety with this level of fuel. It requires longer storage to cool down and has not been adequately tested as to long-term dangers to nuclear reactors. For more information on this, contact sananofresafety.com, where Donna Gilmore has done so much research on high burn-up fuel that she actually lectured the NRC in Washington, D.C. at their request, because she knew things they didn't. Internationally, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant has officially launched the decommissioning and dismantling of its first three units. Say what? There are three units at Chernobyl besides the one we all know about? Yeah. And this move to fully shut down the plant comes 29 years after it became the site of the world's worst nuclear disaster. Though the Unit 4 reactor had been rendered inoperative in 1986, inoperative, such an understatement, the other three units were allowed to operate, with the last one being shut down in 2000. About time, fellas, about time. And last week's numbness of the week has a footnote. Japan plans to promote its Fukushima foods at the Milan Expo 2015 International Exposition. But guess what? The whole thing is riddled with corruption. According to Nuclear Hot Seat's Italian correspondent, Massimo Greco, the president of the organization committee was arrested, is still in prison for corruption, and the expo organization is under supervision of the anti-mafia authority that is supposed to ensure completion of the works, which, alas, will not be completed by the May 1st opening. So Japan. Do you really think that this is a good idea to convince anyone that your Fukushima produce is A-OK -okay to eat and drink? Oh, wait, that didn't stop you from the Monday selection giving a prize to the Fukushima water, so why don't you just go to Milan and pretend like anybody's going to pay any attention to this completely corrupted event? Oh, that's right. You like corruption, don't you? It's your favorite modus operandi. Never mind. We're going to be posting links up on the website, but I wanted to tell you about these three, which are of particular interest. Keith Baverstock of the University of Eastern Finland has published an explanation of exactly how the IAEA and the World Health Organization rigged the numbers around Chernobyl. It is a fascinating read, and of course, it has implications that relate directly to how the numbers are right now being rigged around Fukushima. That's under ChernobylCongress.org, with a lot of stuff after that. That's why I'll have it up on the website. Here's a second one, courtesy Timothy Mousseau. He's the researcher who has been doing such groundbreaking work chronicling the birth defects, actually, if you want to call them that, the mutations in butterflies and other insects around Chernobyl and also around Fukushima. What he has done is compile a list of recent research which contradicts the pro-hormesis propaganda that is currently being put out by the United States Department of Energy. 
For those of you who may not be familiar, hormesis is the insane belief that radiation exposure is actually good for you and can help build a powerful, robust body, as opposed to just the opposite, which is that it erodes your body from the inside out. To those who have ever come at me trying to promote hormesis, I look at them and I go, no, hormesis. Because without them even knowing about it or getting any monetary benefit, they are shilling for the nuclear industry. Well, Tim Musso has put together a great list of sources one can use to come up against the pro-hormesis people. And I mean, this is three solid pages of links to all of the research you could ever want to shut these people down and teach them that radiation exposure is the opposite of something that's good for your health. And finally, and this one really thrilled me, there was a wonderful article that appeared on commondreams.org. It's called The Real Nuclear Threat. And I read it and appreciated its clarity in parsing out the problems of thinking of nuclear bombs and nuclear warfare as an option to anyone and anything that is on this planet. The delight for me came at the end when I saw that the author was Robert Kohler. Now, Robert Kohler is a writer whose work I have followed for many years for the pure, simple enjoyment of reading how this man put the English language together and how his mind worked. He always found interesting angles in on stories and had a gentle, almost poetic way of making his points known. He brilliantly parses out the recent agreement with Iran and exactly what's wrong with it. I won't go into those details here, but I do want to read you the final paragraph of this article. In it, Kohler cites Greg Mallow of the Los Alamos Study Group when he writes, Three privatized nuclear laboratories, Los Alamos, Sandia, and Livermore, are behind the immense investment in upgraded, more destructive nuclear warheads. This aggressive pressure from the American business sector is a lot more frightening than any aggression emanating from Iran and may indicate where the real push for war comes from. War is profitable to too many people. We need a peace treaty with the military-industrial complex. Robert Kohler, writing for CommonDreams.org, and we will have a link to this article and the other two items that I mentioned before under this episode, Nuclear Hot Seat number 199. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations to keep us going and growing. As I'm recording this, it is Monday evening, April 13, and I am in Quebec getting ready for the start tomorrow of all the festivities here for the World Uranium Symposium and also the Uranium Film Festival. I would not be here if it were not for the generous donations of nuclear hot seat listeners such as yourself. But it's not just special trips like these, special events that get covered by your donations. It's also the monthly charges that I have for the website, bandwidth charges, and other social media charges that are starting to come up. As the show gets more popular, it needs more support, which is why I turn to you every week and say, if you can give anything at all, it's greatly appreciated because the energy, the belief, the spirit of it goes a long way towards keeping me in good heart and keeping this show going and growing. Next week, you'll learn all about what's been going on here at the symposium and the film festival. But until then, know that you're the reason that it's happening. And boy, I am really grateful to all of you who help. If there are still some of you who would like to help with this or with the regular expenses we incur, go to NuclearHotSeat.com and on the homepage, scroll down and click on the big red Donate button. 
Know that whatever you can give to help, it's greatly appreciated. Well, last week saw a really lousy court decision in the ongoing attempt of uranium mines to be able to do their dirty work, and that's really dirty work, within the confines of the Grand Canyon, arguably one of the most magnificent treasure sites, not only in the United States, but in the world. We initially took a look at this issue during nuclear hot seat number 192 on February 24th by speaking with Allison Gitlin, who coordinates the campaign to restore and protect the Greater Grand Canyon Eco Region campaign for the Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter. At the time, it seemed as though the legal block to uranium mining was a done deal. But the persistence of the nuclear industry seems to be limitless inspired by the half-life of its pernicious products. And last week's news, well, we'll let Allison tell you herself. And she is joined by Sandy Barr, who is chapter director for the Grand Canyon chapter of the Sierra Club. Allison Gitlin and Sandy Barr, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. This is Allison, and I just want to say thank you for having us on. Hi, this is Sandy Barr, and it's a pleasure to be here. Allison, let's start with you. We spoke about uranium mining in the Grand Canyon, the range of issues there, for nuclear hot seat number 192 back in February. And at that point, it seemed as if any further mining was going to be banned. Give us a brief background to bring people up to speed on the issues involved. Well, at that time, I was telling you how we are now about two years into a 20-year ban on new, unvalidated claims being developed. And what that means is that mining claims that have not gone into uh, development and been able to economically justify that their mining claims are worth developing are not allowed to develop for the next 20 years. That ban does not stop mines that are already considered validated from developing. And so there are a few mines north of Grand Canyon and one mine south of Grand Canyon that already began to develop prior to the mining ban, and they were in what we call standby mode for decades. So we call them zombie mines because they just sat there on the landscape with a fence around them. And then when the price of uranium rose, the mining companies wanted to begin developing them again. And so the Canyon Mine is one of those. It's south of Grand Canyon. It's just a few miles from the rim of the canyon. We have been fighting this mine because we don't feel that it has a validated claim. And it is being allowed to open based on an environmental impact statement and a um, operating procedure that is based from 1986. And the Forest Service claims that there's no new information since 1986 that would justify updating the environmental impact statement. Let's switch this over to you, Sandy. Last week in court, U.S. District Court Judge David Campbell denied a request to halt new uranium mining in the canyon uranium mine. What just happened? How did this come about? First of all, yes, so canyon mine was first proposed back in the 1980s, and the environmental impact statement that is on record is from 1986. And they they started uh, to develop the mine and then suspended activities when uranium prices fell in the early 90s. So uh, they never mined any ore from this mine. And when they proposed to reopen the mine, we said, look, you have to look at new circumstances. That's what we said to the Forest Service. A lot of things have changed, and so there needs to be initial uh, or additional environmental analysis and you need to do formal consultation with the Havasupai tribe as well as other tribes. And they basically said, no, we did the analysis back in 86, and that's good enough. To me, it's pretty outrageous that the judge did not recognize that they should look at this further. The things that have changed are the Red Butte traditional cultural property was established in 2010. 
So that should trigger additional consultation with the tribes and also additional National Environmental Policy Act analysis. There are endangered species that have been added to the endangered species list, including the California condor. We know a lot more about what's going on with the water in the region. So with this court case, what was expected from the ruling? What were you believing was going to happen as a result of this case? We hoped that the judge would tell the Forest Service, hey, you have to go back and look at this new information and do environmental analysis and consult with the tribe to have the suit by tribe specifically. Was this a decision that rested just with the judge or was there a larger body involved? It was just Judge Campbell. He's a federal district court judge based in Phoenix. Makes me wonder what his political or business connections might be that would make him go in such an outrageous direction. I think the thing with Judge Campbell is he tends to give the agencies the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, that is fairly consistent in his rulings relative to issues that we've had that have gone before him. He shows a lot of deference to these agencies. And in this case, the agency is not acting prudently, and we had hoped he would recognize that. Wasn't there a 2012 decision to ban new uranium mining across 1 million acres near the Grand Canyon? And if so, why is that not in effect in this case? The 1 million acre mineral withdrawal or ban on mining in this area applies to new mining and to claims that were not validated. And so in this case, the Forest Service and the judge are uh, making the assumption that this is a valid claim and that it can go forward. And, and we've seen some other mines go forward as well. So if, if a, a claim has already been recognized, then the mineral withdrawal, the mining ban, doesn't affect it. What it does affect are the thousands of other claims that were filed in this uh, withdrawal area. What does this mean in terms of the tribal rights of the Havasupai tribe? Is this something you can speak to? Well, it's always best for the tribes to speak for themselves, and the Havasupai have done a great job of speaking for themselves on this issue, uh, challenging this when it was first proposed back in the 1980s and uh, continuing that challenge I think what it says, though, is that, you know, the court is not recognizing the significance of the traditional cultural property or of the potential impact of this mine on the waters that feed Havasu Creek, you know, part of the lifeblood of the Havasupai people. And it's important to them culturally, but also a huge part of their economy. And it seems like neither the Forest Service or the judge have recognized that. And isn't there also potential danger to the water supply of the Grand Canyon itself? Havasu Creek does flow into Grand Canyon. So the Havasu tribe actually live in the bottom of Grand Canyon, in a side canyon of Grand Canyon. But there are several springs that do flow into Grand Canyon that are extremely important for biodiversity. Some estimates have said that there is 500 times the biodiversity at springs as there is in the surrounding landscape. And not only is the wildlife dependent on the springs, but those recreating in Grand Canyon are dependent on those springs as well. And they have tremendous cultural significance for a number of tribes. The water that feeds those springs comes from below the area where the canyon mine is being dug. So if there is contamination in the groundwater below the canyon mine, it could spread out and contaminate a number of the springs in Grand Canyon. And not only that, but the mining effort is going to use water. So it could also 
lead to depletion or diminishing of some of those springs as well. And so that could have huge effects on the wildlife and the people of the Grand Canyon region. What has been the response among the Coalition of Conservation Groups and that had challenged the – let me start that one over again because my notes are a little bit wonky. Um, what has been the response among the Coalition of Conservation Groups? The response has been very strong. People are outraged by the decision, and there is a strong commitment – by the conservation groups, by the tribe, uh, and others to continue to fight to protect Grand Canyon and to protect its waters from uranium mining. What legal steps are now ahead that could continue the fight? The key thing would be to appeal this decision to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's what we're looking at right now, um, and that's what we hope to do. If that appeal goes forward, or as that appeal goes forward, will that in any way stop the mining from taking place? There would have to be an action to get, like a temporary restraining order to halt the mining in the short term and uh, pending decision by the Ninth Circuit. We would have to file to stop that. Right now, there's an agreement that they won't start mining there until April 15th, but April 15th is next week. What, if anything, is in place or could be put in place to inform tourists who are coming to this magnificent site as to what is going on to contaminate it? There's a lot of information online about canyon mine and about the issue of uranium mining around Grand Canyon. We've also conducted tours out to the mining site, not into the mine area itself, but out to the mining site to show people where it is and talk about the implications. In the past, we've done outreach at Grand Canyon itself and handed people information to people who are visiting there. Also, to inform them that there's actually a uranium mine in Grand Canyon National Park itself that is just recently being cleaned up. Uh, It's a historic mine that has contaminated Horn Creek, which is in the canyon itself. So that's always, I think, something important to provide to people. It's not that we're making it up that these mines pose a risk. We have history as our teacher. This is Allison. I just wanted to point out also that the orphan mine, when the Canyon Mine Environmental Impact Statement was prepared, They actually looked to the orphan mine as an example of the possibility of being able to mine uranium safely. And it wasn't until after that 1986 environmental impact statement was complete that the U.S. EPA went out to that site and determined that there was far more contamination than they ever realized. And they actually had to move a fence back because there was soil contamination extending outward from the site that visitors to Grand Canyon were able to come in contact with. They had to remove the head frame because it was considered hot. And, you know, this is all at U.S. taxpayer expense that we went in and we cleaned this all up. And now there is a big site at Grand Canyon with a fence around it on our public lands that, you know, is going to be forever contaminated, including Horn Creek and Salt Creek below that site are going to be forever contaminated because we don't know how to clean them up. You know, as a former backpacker, it's always key to know when you're going into an area where you can't carry a huge amount of water on your back that there's going to be water there that can be filtered and that you can use safely. But it sounds like any water that is found downstream of these creeks is potentially contaminated with radionuclides. Yes, that's correct. So when you get a backpacking permit, For the area below the orphan mine, you are warned that you should not drink that water unless it's an emergency. Wow. That I wasn't expecting. What are the risks that visitors do face from the water supply or from walking there, perhaps the dust being kicked up? It's hard to say. A lot of the risk from dealing with this contamination is if you get it in your body, if you do drink it or you inhale it or you ingest the dust. And so 
you know, I can't say that there is a direct risk to you if you're visiting the site, but there is an elevated risk beyond what we should have to be exposed to that there is this contamination in the area. The bottom line is there's higher levels of radiation than background, and there have been a lot of studies in areas where they've done uranium mining and they've found elevated levels. The other thing I wanted to point out is this orphan mine is not just on our public lands, but it's in one of our premier national parks, Grand Canyon National Park. And so to me, it's like a significant example of why we shouldn't allow additional uranium mines. I wanted to make sure that we got addressed while we're chatting is just the history of uranium mining in the region. It affects public lands, but it also has significantly affected the Native American tribes in the region. And that's one of the reasons why the northern Arizona tribes all came out in support of the mineral withdrawal, the mining ban. There are still hundreds of mines, uranium mines, that have not been cleaned up on Navajo Nation lands. There are contaminated wells. There are health impacts that continue. And so there is a pretty sordid history with uranium mining. They try to tell us that, oh, we're doing everything so much better, but they, you know, the bottom line is they haven't changed. And remember, the plan for this canyon mine was developed in, 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 the, in the 80s, and the environmental impact statement was done in 1986. So I think that that argument is pretty empty, that everything is, is different. Sounds like it's pretty much the same as it always has been, which is let's not pay any attention to the problems that are being raised in the long run by this short-term whatever it is that is motivating them. Money. <laughs> Money. <laughs> God only knows. It's motivating the, the... You're right. Like, that's going to stop their family, from their, their offspring from being born with birth defect. We can go there, but we don't have to because I'm talking to the tribe here. <laughs> okay. So let me just get one more thing in, and that is this coming week, the World Uranium Symposium is happening up in Quebec, and that is simultaneous with the Uranium Film Festival which is also taking place there with some overlap of the days. And on April 16, they have a day that is specifically devoted to human rights, indigenous people's rights, and governance issues. This is not just for Canada, but for the entire world. Do you have any idea whether there is going to be representation from the Havasupai people during this event? And if not, can we get them on a jet real fast? I don't know, but I agree. It would, I mean, in the past, the tribe has traveled to Europe and other places to try to raise awareness about this issue, and it would be great if they could be there. Send us the info, and I'll make sure it gets to the tribe. It will happen as soon as we get off of this call. Is there any kind of long-term planning that might be able to alleviate this problem so it does not come up again? Absolutely. This mineral withdrawal is actually three years into it now, and I know how quickly 20 years goes, and so that's one of the reasons why we're currently working on trying to get a national monument established for this area and other areas as well to permanently protect these lands from uranium mining and other harmful activities. I will send you a link to the website for that monument proposal and as well as links to our social media. We have a new Facebook page, Twitter, et cetera, that we're getting started. So I can send you links to all of that so that when people listen to this, if they'd like to get more information, they have a way to do that. People can also look up the Sierra Club Grand Canyon Protection Campaign on social media, and we will post all of our developments there. We have a Facebook and WordPress page and Twitter as well. And so I can make sure that all that information gets disseminated. We have an email list. We send out monthly emails if people are interested in following the campaign. We right now have an action they can take asking President Obama to establish the Grand Canyon Watershed National Monument. So we're encouraging people 
to do that because Arizona, we have a challenging political climate sometimes, but the people of Arizona are very supportive of land protection, and so we're trying to get as many people as possible to support a national monument. And what would be that website? It's ArizonaSierraClub.org. We will put all this information up under this episode, number 199. And for now, I want to thank both you, Sandy Barr, and also Allison Gitlin of the Sierra Club Grand Canyon chapter for all the work that you are doing and for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Allison Gitlin and Sandy Barr of the Grand Canyon chapter of the Sierra Club. A lot of links for this issue, and they'll all be posted up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 199. As I'm in the final stages of editing this program, I am privileged to be at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec, where I had the good fortune to hear part of a talk by Anne Maria Tapp, who is Energy Program Director for the Grand Canyon Trust. Here is what she had to share as her takeaways after that session concluded. My name is Anne Maria Tapp, and I'm the director of the energy program for the Grand Canyon Trust based in Flagstaff, Arizona. My work focuses on safeguarding the Colorado Plateau from the destructive impacts of uranium mining and milling, most specifically fighting the mines on the rim of the Grand Canyon, defending the 20-year mineral withdrawal that was enacted in 2012, and ensuring that the White Mesa Uranium Mill, which is the only operating conventional uranium mill in North America, is compliant with all laws and regulations designed to protect public and environmental health. I'm here at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City, Canada, where we did a workshop on Grand Canyon uranium issues. And at the end of the symposium, day one, we were asked to summarize three takeaways from our workshop, which I was asked to share today. The three takeaways that we came out from the workshop with were, first, that when we achieve great victories like the 2012 mineral withdrawal to protect the Grand Canyon watershed, we have to strive as a community to make those protections permanent. And the reason for this is because when industry sets a goal, they don't start on the last day before these things can be achieved. And so we as an environmental community also need to start early. And when we achieve these impermanent protections, while celebrating the victory, we also need to look forward and realize that they do expire and we need to make them permanent because ultimately the reason for the withdrawal is to protect the environment and to protect the sacred sites of Native people, and those are lasting goals that need lasting protections. Second is a very technical issue that I'm a little bit reticent to even share just because it's sort of in the weeds, but we've encountered this problem across Australia, across Canada, across North America, where we have these large waste pits of radioactive waste that are covered in water. And both industry and the regulators tend to say that there's no way to monitor radon emissions from these liquid-covered impoundments. But there's also fairly good evidence through scientific studies and EPA reports that show that there actually are radon emissions and corresponding serious health effects of these liquid-covered impoundments. So I issue a call to the scientific community to produce more reports and more studies to show how to measure and calculate these radon emissions from these large ponds so that we, as the environmental community, and as people living near sites that are impacted by the nuclear fuel industry, can tell what the health effects are to our communities. And the final message that I wanted to share from the Uranium Symposium is the message of shared hope, shared success, and shared challenges. And across the symposium, across the challenges faced by communities in Australia, in Canada, and in North America, is a trend of shared victories, but also shared challenges of challenging large corporations with basically unlimited resources. And in contrast, we are a resource-limited community that is very resourceful. And when we do have these shared successes and when we do have these shared gatherings, it's important to be as open and as clear about our victories and our challenges as possible so that we can come together as an international community to find the best way forward. And Mariah Tapp, 
Energy Program Director for Grand Canyon Trust. A fortuitous way to be able to end this report on the Grand Canyon knowing that we will keep checking in and finding out latest developments as they happen to bring them to you, the Nuclear Hot Seat listening audience. For our second interview, we return to Chuck Johnson. He is Northwest Nuclear Campaigner in Oregon and Washington State for Physicians for Social Responsibility. We spoke with Chuck on Nuclear Hot Seat number 195 four weeks ago. But at that time, we focused on the Hanford site and didn't have the time to include his information about problems at the Columbia Generating Station. Here's that information now. Chuck, tell us about the Columbia Generating Station and the current set of problems there. Columbia Generating Station was part of a group of five reactors that the Washington Public Power Supply System, a consortium of publicly owned utilities based in Washington, but also in the north, rest of the Northwest, whose acronym spells WHOOPS, had attempted to build, and it's the only one they completed of the five. It's a GE boiling water reactor, and it's of a similar vintage. It's slightly newer than the ones that melted down in, in Japan. But as Ed Lyman from the Union of Concerned Scientists pointed out when he was out here visiting, it's actually combined some of the worst aspects of the Mark I and Mark II containments of a a GE boiling water reactor in that it's a small containment, just like the ones in Japan, which can be overwhelmed in a loss of coolant accident by hydrogen gas that forces its way out and can cause explosions. So it has that problem. And uh, for that reason, the the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is requiring that they put vents into it, although they've given them all the way till 2017 to finally get that done. But it also has some of the radiation suppression aspects of the Mark II containment, which are tubes underneath the reactor itself that feed down into a water pool called the Taurus below, and they're right directly below the reactor in in the Mark II which means if the fuel starts melting down, it'll melt these pipes and ruin the waste suppression system, which means then that instead of filtering radioactive materials through water, they'll just directly go into the atmosphere out these vents that they've had to build because they uh, don't want the thing to cause explosions. If we had an accident at CGS and these vents are put in, they'll be fire hosing radioactive materials throughout the Columbia Basin from the accident. So we were very concerned when we found out about the fact that this reactor was similar. Because as all these other problems existed at Hanford, I, the Columbia Generating Station kind of faded into the background in terms of people's concerns about the, what was happening on the Hanford site. But after Fukushima, we realized that this is probably the greatest threat to a major accident. That and if they turn on the VIT plant and it blows up also would be probably of equal concern. We have more seismic activity in the region than was known when the plant was built. And, uh, again, Ed Lyman was saying that about half the plants in the United States were built for seismic accidents that are less than what they now know is possible in the region, and ours is no exception to that. Ours, They built it for 0.25 ground motion uh, at the plant site, and uh, U.S. Geological Survey seismologists believe that it's Potentially, you could have a 0.6 ground motion or more than double the ground motion that they built the plant to withstand. So if you have the plant breaking down in an earthquake, you could possibly lose coolant, just as happened in Japan. And if you lose coolant to the reactor, it can melt down very quickly within a few hours. What current actions are taking place with Physicians for Social Responsibility and other organizations to do something about this dangerous situation? After Oregon, Washington, Physicians for Social Responsibility formed our task force. Uh, We were joined by local groups of the Sierra Club, Heart of America Northwest, Columbia Riverkeeper, Alliance for Democracy, No Nukes Northwest, and Fellowship of Reconciliation are, the, I believe, the formal uh, members of our coalition for Nuclear Free Northwest. We have a website, nuclearfreenw.org, that you can check out and see more information about what we're doing. Basically, 
the campaign revolves around convincing the publicly owned utilities that actually own this plant and operate it that uh, we would be safer and that we would be financially better off if we would close this plant down. Currently, we're focusing a lot of our effort on the city of Seattle, which is a co-owner on this plant, through its municipal utility, Seattle City Light. We also have an effort going in Clark County, which is Vancouver, Washington, across the river from Portland, where the Clark County PUD is also a, a co-owner, and we have some uh, members of that board who are interested in, in this issue and willing to talk with us about it. We're hoping within the next couple of months that we will have the first of the utilities to take a position for shutdown, and, and probably that will be Seattle. It's looking very positive. And those of you who are in the Seattle area or know people who are in the Seattle area, if you could have them contact us, uh, we can use your help right now to make sure that we have a victory there. And, again, what would be the best way to contact you for those people who wish to take a stance and get active, as so many of the listeners to Nuclear Hot Seed are and do? Well, you can go ahead and send me an email directly at chuck at Oregon PSR, as in Physicians for Social Responsibility, dot org, or you can go to our website. Which is PSR dot org slash chapters slash Oregon. Or you can just Google Oregon PSR and it will pop right up. Chuck, in closing, is there anything else that you would like to add? Just that I feel very encouraged these days about our ability to defeat the nuclear power industry, not just here in the Northwest, but everywhere. The consistent lying that the nuclear power industry has engaged in since day one continues to be exposed, and I think that the effort to revive the nuclear industry with the nuclear renaissance is sputtering and failing, and the, the onset of renewable options, wind and solar, and to some extent the dirty ally of cheap natural gas, which, you know, I'm not terribly pleased about that, but in terms of the nuclear power industry, it's, it's really been a problem. I think that we're going to be able to, in the next few years, shut down an awful lot of nuclear power plants, and I don't think that they will be able to build very many new ones at all. I think we're winning. We're still a long way away from having ultimate victory, but I believe that we're winning, and, and I feel very encouraged. Thank you for that roundup piece, because it's important to realize that we've made a tremendous amount of progress in this battle. It's David and Goliath, but like I like to remind people, David won. Right on. Chuck Johnson of Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. And thank you. That was Chuck Johnson, Northwest Nuclear Campaigner for Physicians for Social Responsibility. Memo to Trevor Noah. He's the new guy coming in to take over from Jon Stewart as host of The Daily Show. Trevor, you need something to distinguish yourself as you put your unique stamp on this much-beloved program. So, how about a nuclear pundit? Let's face it, with the recent defections of Jason Jones and Samantha B, there's lots of space for new people with the ranks as you put together your daily show crew. So let's get nuclear on the agenda, okay? This is one place where you can really exceed what John was able to do with the show. Know that my people are ready to talk to your people. A big hey and hello to everyone who has come all the way to Quebec for the Uranium Film Festival and the World Uranium Symposium. I'm here. I'm covering it. So if you see me sitting alone at any point, please come over, introduce yourself. Let me learn more about what you do and the issues you address with your work. My goal is to learn what I can do to support you in your work. And that's a question, quite frankly, that we all need to be asking each other. What can I do to support you in your work? I'm looking forward to getting the answers up close and personal here in Quebec. Here's today's final thought. I read an item this week from Radical.org, R-A-T-I-C-A-L.org, 
citing the late Dr. Rosalie Brutel from a 1982 book, Nuclear Witnesses, Insiders Speak Out. The book's author, Leslie Freeman, wrote, It is the premise of this book that if the American people knew the truth about radiation, there would be no nuclear issue. The myth is that there is a safe threshold of exposure to radioactive material, a permissible dose below which no health effect can be detected. Dr. Bertel wrote, There's been a campaign since 1951 to convince the public that low-level radiation is harmless. People have a right to know what's happening to human health. The patriotic thing to do is to get it all out into the open. Let people know what's happening. As much as some people attempt to deny the facts, all of us on this planet, by the new fire, a select group of boys have been playing with since the 1940s. Our collective gene pool of life, evolving for hundreds of millions of years, has been seriously damaged in less than the past 50. The time remaining to reverse this culture of lemming death is on the wane. In the future, what will you tell our grandchildren about what you did in the prime of your life to turn around this death process? To which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, And will those grandchildren ever have a chance to be born, and to be born healthy? The time to get busy and protect our future is now. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 14, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Asahi, Massimo Greco, rt.com, chernobylcongress.org, nuclearhistory.wordpress.com, Japan Times, Common Dreams, koin.com, keptv, PenEnergy.com, Tokyo Electric Power Company, the Nuclear Apologists at World Nuclear News, SCGrandCanyon.wordpress.com, and all the linked together activists in the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you, yes you, are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts or just check us out on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. And our YouTube channel carries the shows under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Thank you, Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear impacts every man, woman, and child on the planet. And when you are aware of this fact, if it depresses you, reach out to someone you love, give them a hug, and tell them so. Because the human connection is the one thing that will keep us going. And we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't you dare go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.